Attention all Dundum Implement employees, please. We have a meeting in the conference room. Why don't we all proceed into the conference room? You two in the conference room with me. Michael wants to see everyone in the conference room. We're going to have a little uh, brainstorming session in the conference room. Yeah, let's go. Conference room? Yes, conference room, five minutes. Slowly and quietly gather the ladies in the conference room. Brian has a very special, important presentation to do, which we'll be doing in the conference room in 10 minutes. Conference room, five minutes. The conference room. Let's go! Ow! Conference room, 15 minutes. Conference room, choppity chip chop. Everybody in the conference room now. Let's go. Let's do it. Conference room, everybody's in there. I don't care if you are gay or straight or a lesbian or overweight. Get in there right now or I'm gonna lose it! A uh, race car? Doesn't have to be a race car. Oh my God, if you're wearing a dress, please keep your knees together. Nobody wants to see that all. Oh. How is this not a pyramid scheme? All right, let me explain it again. I've noticed we've been having a lot of conference room meetings mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if perhaps those are a bit... Um, Disruptive. Yes. Welcome. Thank you. As The Office is getting into its season six stride, we have the second installment in the Jim Becomes a Manager arc in an episode that seems to be no one's favorite. I would like to file a huge, enormous, massive complaint. Yet it's genuinely genius and subtle in its day in the life of a paper company style of storytelling. Well, to be fair, Jim, James, Jimothy, if you're following along my field guides, I've spoken about the stress relief effect several times. For a quick catch up, it basically means that the repilot that was the episode stress relief essentially set a new bar for what the Office fandom came to expect as a truly great episode of The Office. Forgive me for caring, right? So far, we've had some great episodes in season six, all of which are rated significantly lower on scale from the general fandom, and the promotion is no exemption to this. And it makes sense in the way that this was written, we'll get into it later, but this was done by Jen Salata, both directed and written. So let's break this one down. Starting off the bat, we have the first point of friction between Jim and Dwight. In the cold opening, answering this question right away, how will Jim being a manager impact his prank life? If you stop crying, I'll stop writing. Stop. I'm not! <laughs> also, we should point out that this is the first time we see the additional office. Prior to the promotion, it was just unseen, or there was just file cabinets, and it was Martin's desk at some point. Oh, yeah. Right after the opening credits, we have the second plot point of friction with Jim and Michael. Conference room in five minutes, and I suggest that you bring a snack because we may be in there for a while. Michael. Yes. Can I talk to you in my office for a second? Sure, but could I first talk to you in my office? Almost directly, we get this subtle feel that the rest of the office staff also isn't very happy about Jim's promotion. Can I also be a boss? Where would Catholicism be without the Pope's? Side note here, donuts are my kryptonite too. Hey, I'm gonna go for a jog. People on the internet are saying I'm getting fat. Oh, yeah. I also wonder what romantic birdhouses are like. My cousin makes the most amazing romantic birdhouse mailboxes. You're not registered for a birdhouse, are you? The girl in the book has a terrace outside of her bedroom, and I just love that. It's impractical. I'm not going to try to get a house like that. No, we're not. The setup for this episode and the real problems our heroes need to overcome is this. There is a reason why I'm here. Yes, you went over my head to Wallace. No, it's because you also have a lot of weaknesses, Michael. And this is a random, random, random bit, but I'm gonna see if I can fit this in a deeper meaning somehow. Hey, why haven't we ever? Uh... We have. Uh, we have. 
countless times. It has to be here for a reason. The element of psychological torment. This Michael and Jim trying to reach a decision feels a lot like marriage. Stop it! Stop it! Bickering! Stop it! See, I'm Jim in this metaphor, and she's Michael. In a good way, calm down, I'll get there. What I mean is that we split up a lot of our household stuff like Jim and Michael. Sounds like your classic big picture decision. Which will clearly affect the day-to-day -day well-being of our employees. I'm big picture, and she's more day-to-day. -day. Except our personalities are a little bit reversed. I tend to be much more calculated in my decision making. Oh my god, are you gonna make another pro and con list? I'm gonna kill myself. And she's more passionate. Here's a tough decision for you. You suck. You suck. Of cool and youth and and passionately God. and i don't mean that in a bad way she's compassionate and generous when i want to be the opposite to love's eternal glory and i help us stay in the black and she helps us be you know better people example he handed out jello shots at the 23rd mile of the steamtown marathon see see i got there i can be very surprising anyway the b plot of pam and the registry is a little cringe why doesn't Crate and Barrel let you register for a toaster full of cash? Yes! Cash basket! Nice work, Pam. It feels like this would be better suited if Jim and Pam were in this together. Alone, it's awkward. Like you you want my money? Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, I get it. That's the point. And when Jim gets real with Michael, it is really great. I think that you are able to take constructive criticism very well. Ha! That, I am not known for that. Do you really expect us to believe you're somebody else? Do you really expect me to not push you up against the wall, biatch? You need to do something about your coffee breath. Okay, you need to no, do something shut about up, your... Shut up, shut up, Come on, guys, get out of here. Where are the turtles? Where are they? Non-transferable. Doesn't matter. Out, please. I'm calling the Better Business Bureau. Yeah, well, I'm calling the ungrateful biatch hotline. Then this quick follow-up. I don't think you're good at making tough decisions. Ah. <sighs> You think it's easy? It's your job. I don't want to work. I just want to bang on this mug all day. I do not mind. Yes, I do. No, I don't. Yes, I do. No. I love what Michael does here, though, which essentially pits Jim's pride against Jim's decision-making skills. And he coerces him into doing something that Jim just criticized Michael for. Run yourself out there and tell them. We are going to give those raises to the sales staff. What the hell? Why are you being such a jerk? Michael, that secret genius. Is he some sort of secret genius? And could anything be more human than watching the entire office staff so quickly turn on Jim? Thank you, Jim, for thinking that we're smart people. And Michael stands up to get Jim out of the situation by saying nothing. My plan, a man pan. That's not how that goes. And then we have this very unique series talking head. And Jim. Yeah. Who said that? I think it was Creed. Yep. Following that, everyone discovers the performance base rating method. What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Kevin. In Dwight's mutiny speech, is Wilson putting out A plus work here? Are we idiots? What right does Jim have to claim authority? Hmm? Is he as good a salesman as I? In a speech that somehow feels fascist and also Lord of the Ringsist. Tick, that's a clock. The time is getting very close. It's now or never. What say you? What say you? And because people seem to like it when I call out stuff like this, if you listen really closely as Michael goes back into Jim's office, you can hear Kevin once more. What does a bean mean? What does a bean mean? <laughs> And we close out our main storyline with a heartfelt sequence with Jim and Michael. I used to have to do this part alone, and it was the worst. I have something I would like to give you, Jim. But that's it. Like, we're going to dive into the deeper meaning from here, because that's where the fun stuff is. Michael, what does a bean mean? What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Kevin. Why can't you? My time is just as valuable as yours. Not according to the beans. I believe this episode explores the very human topic of complaining versus action and the way those things cycle. Simply put, every action taken by anyone inevitably brings criticism. You know, it's a myth that women have to gain more than nine pounds in a pregnancy. Look at these actresses. Some of them lose weight. 
One of my favorite quotes on this topic is from Jane Wagner in The Search for Significant Life in the Universe, in which she says, I personally believe that we developed language because of our deep inner need to complain. Everybody's gonna complain and bitch. And Dwight's entire thing in this episode centers around motivating people to act. I am so pissed at this company. And Jim. Yeah. People are starting to notice how terrible Jim is. <sighs> it's great. Eventually, they'll rise up and revolt. And that's because he understands the very human tendency to rather complain about something than actually act. If the people here were our founding fathers, the Revolutionary War would have been delayed 10 years because Stanley Washington was napping. Phyllis Hancock was still signing the declaration. As he finds out, it's a misguided attempt at a coup, not because people aren't angry, emotions are clearly high. What does a bean mean? But rather it's because the people either feel that there is no action that would lead to their desired outcome, or what Dwight's suggesting is probably overkill. Drag Jim out of his office, talk. Take his keys away from him, tick. But the alternative is just to file complaints, which they know Toby's useless. I merely listen to him for God. That is outrageous. Something the cold opening kind of hit on after all is why Dwight isn't taking his complaints to HR in the first place. Did he hit you? No. Did you cry? No. Did you feel like crying? No. I'm just gonna write held back tears. The only other thing that the office staff can do is to go over Michael and Jim's head and speak with Wallace directly. At least Jim was being direct. Thank you. He was man. telling us his dumbass plan. But that would just make him look like complainers. So again, we have this catch-22 situation. Catch-22. Yes. Feeling that there is no outcome. And as such, they opt to complain and criticize rather than act. So I think the point here is that complaining basically is the chosen action by the majority, and it's essentially useless. Those who do act, on the other hand, their actions, even well thought out and strategic actions, impact those very same complainers. All actions taken in this episode are met with inaction. Uh, uh, criticism. He's telling us his dumbass plan. Or those actions aren't impactful enough to even remember. Hey, why haven't we ever? Um... We have. Told you I'd get that one in there. That's what she said. <laughs> or those actions were taken to take advantage of others. Oh, why are you assuming you'd get the whole thing? This episode manages to make this bleak look at human inaction and our need to criticize and our need to complain of valid actions and the general ineptitude of our bureaucratic systems that keep us all in line like sheep. <laughs> and yet, it leaves us with the feels. I think the message here is that every action will always have a reaction that most likely escalates in ways that we least expect and that we don't want to happen. And yet, that shouldn't deter us from trying. Jim won't sign my expense report. That is not okay. That day is, to day. That, that is, is day a bit, to day. No. Which honestly is the pessimistic writing of the real world that we've come to expect from this series. Which leads us straight into the ratings. This is the worst. <laughs> this had better be terrible. Okay, this cold opening. I'm a sucker for Jim Dwight pranks. This one rubs me the wrong way in one sense. Jim probably knows he shouldn't be doing this stuff anymore. He said as much in the past. I really don't think I should be doing this stuff anymore, though. Oh. No, just because of the promotion. We're starting to get to the point in the series where the writers seem to forsake things that characters have already learned or they already have comprehended. Are we idiots? However, Wilson's acting here and his intensity, it conveys all the characters' state of mind and all wraps very well with the deeper meaning of this episode. I'm giving this one a four out of five. I disagree. And honestly, this episode deserves the exact same ratings. Gossip. I really feel that after the craziness that season five became, in which every episode started having to one up the last one, along with the exciting but fantastical Michael Scott Paper Company episode, gossip, the meeting, and the promotion are all equally incredible Office-esque episodes of The Office. And as I've said a few times now, you could pluck this episode, drop it anywhere in the storyline up to date, and it really feel at home. It really feels as though the showrunners in these early episodes of this season were doing everything that they could to retain the heart and soul of the show. But we'll see how that actually progresses in a post-Niagara world. Which is why we're having it 
in Niagara Falls. As the season has been relentlessly foreshadowing the wedding so far, and for that, subscribe. We're gonna unfold the drama all the more as the Jim Michael co-manager stuff persists. It's a killer new dance move. And we get the rest of the highs and lows of season six. So thank you so much for watching. Join us next week as we talk about Niagara. It's after midnight. You're, You're married. married. Oh, he's married. Oh, that's not how that works. We'll see you then.